Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to a Reagan Forum, hosted by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. The Center for Public Affairs offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. The Reagan Forum podcast that you are listening to is only one of the eight different podcasts that the Reagan Foundation and Institute produces. In fact, this is only one of two that are audio only. The rest each come with video. One of our favorite podcasts is called The Reagan Retrospective. These podcasts are stories shared by people who knew President and Mrs. Reagan best, people who worked with them, were friends with them, and knew them throughout their life. Each podcast brings you new behind-the-scenes stories from the Reagan years. They're funny, they're poignant, and they're rich in history. Over the past three months, we have recorded over a dozen of these podcasts, and they're now being released a few per month. So today we're going to share four of our most recent Reagan Retrospective podcasts. We hope you enjoy them as much as we do. You may recognize the name KT McFarland as a political commentator, a civil servant, or even an author. In 2017, she served as the 28th United States Deputy National Security Advisor under President Trump. But back in the 1980s, she was a speechwriter for people such as Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, and she was a spokesperson for the Pentagon. In this Reagan retrospective, she shares her unique experiences working directly with President Ronald Reagan during his administration. You'll discover the behind-the-scenes story of the famous Star Wars speech, how President Reagan's initiatives transformed the Pentagon, and how his actions rejuvenated the morale and pride of the U.S. military. Let's listen. My name is K.T. McFarland, and I knew President Reagan because I was in the Reagan administration as the speechwriter and spokesman at the Pentagon. I was in charge of over the communications department at the Pentagon, so I would do everything from write speeches to oversee congressional testimony of the Secretary of Defense, but my real interaction with President Reagan was when he gave speeches about defense issues. So I would often write the first draft of a lot of the speeches he gave, including my great claim to fame was the Star Wars speech. Um, I wrote the speech, I wrote all these great words that nobody remembers because the only thing anybody remembers from that speech is the two paragraphs Ronald Reagan wrote himself, which was calling on the scientists and the engineering and innovative communities in the United States to develop a, a missile shield. But when he gave the speech the very next day, the New York Post had a headline that says, Reagan planned to Star Wars plan to zap red nukes. So the way people referred to it ever after was a Star Wars initiative. And the great thing about that was ultimately that's how we won the Cold War. When I first went to work at the Pentagon at the beginning of the Reagan administration, President Reagan had had the Secretary of Defense into, his, into the Oval Office. And President Reagan said to Cap Weinberger, my boss, why are these guys, these military guys, not in their uniforms? We were informed that because after the Vietnam War and the anti-military attitude in the country, the military were not allowed to wear their uniforms, that it was too provocative, too militaristic. So the first thing Reagan did was say, everybody back in their uniforms. So the Secretary of Defense put a decree out that if you're gonna work at the Pentagon and you're in the military, we wanna see you in your uniform. The problem was, the military hadn't worn their uniforms in five or six years, they didn't fit. So they'd all, all of a sudden you would see people running across, jogging across Memorial Bridge, going from the Pentagon to the Lincoln Memorial and back, trying to get fit so that they could fit into their uniforms. And so President Reagan, as part of his defense buildup, wanted to, to send a signal to the men and women in uniform. Now the first thing he did was to give them a pay raise because the military, the most junior enlisted men and women, um, their pay was so low that they qualified for food stamps. And Reagan changed all that, but to make a symbol to how much the President of the United States, President Reagan, would honor the service of the military, he asked Pat Cap Weinberger, there's gotta be somebody we can give an award to. Um, you know, instead of a posthumous award, there's gotta be some person we've given an award to, which we haven't had a presentation by the President. So sure enough, we found um, a, a sergeant, Benavides, and President Reagan came to the Pentagon on a beautiful sunny day and in the courtyard of the Pentagon um, gave, gave the award and pinned it on its shoulder. And as a result, 
the military understood this is a president who believes in us, who's gonna give us the things that we need, the resources we need to do our job, and is going to honor us. I was not in the car when this happened, but a good friend of mine, Ed Rollins, who was President Reagan's political director, told me this story, and I don't think it's been written anywhere. But President Reagan gave a speech at Arlington Memorial Cemetery in the morning. It was Memorial Day. And in the United States in the late 1970s, the one topic nobody would discuss, no political leader would never discuss Vietnam. It was like the third rail, because you couldn't win to talk about it. Reagan understood that, but he wanted to honor the people who served, regardless of the outcome of that war. And so he went to Memorial, to Arlington Cemetery on Memorial Day, and he thanked them for their service. And he talked about Vietnam. And I'm looking around seeing these men, mostly men in uniform, some were in wheelchairs, some looked like they were sleeping rough on the streets, and they were crying. Some of them had their, 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 their battle medals, you know, pinned to their khaki or their t-shirts and Reagan honored them for their service. So I was in the, it, um, at my office at Fox News telling this story to my friend, um, Ed Rollins, and he said, do you know what happened after that speech? He said, you said goodbye to President Reagan. He got on the plane and he went to Colorado Springs to the Air Force Academy. And he gave the commencement address at the Air Force Academy. It was one of the first years that women had graduated. And President Reagan gave the first salute to a thousand young men and women um, from the Air Force Academy. So then President Reagan gets in the car and is on his way to California. And he's with, I think he was with Mike Deaver and he was with Ed Rollins. And so Ed reaches over to the president and he says, you know, President Reagan, that was such a, a remarkable thing you did. You gave the first salute to those thousand graduates of the Air Force Academy. They'll remember that for the rest of their lives because the first salute any officer Gets is, is the momentous moment for him, but to get it from the President of the United States, your Commander-in-Chief, is even more important. And then President Reagan said to Ed Rollins, he said, Ed, I didn't do it for them, I did it for me, because I wanted to look in their eyes, every single one of them, I didn't want to see them as statistics and numbers, because I wanted to know that if I have to send them into battle and into conflict, and I will not hesitate if I have to, but I wanted to know them as people, as individuals. To me, that was the perfect example of Ronald Reagan. He honored the men and women who had fought in the Vietnam War at Arlington Cemetery in the morning, and then in the afternoon, he flew across the country and talked about the future of the country and future leaders, and he talked to the next generation of officers. If you enjoy wine, you may have heard of Fess Parker Winery, located in Los Olivos, California. Ashley Parker Schneider, now a principal of the winery, once worked as a trip coordinator in President Reagan's Office of Presidential Advance. At the close of the Reagan administration, she then accepted a position in the Public Affairs Office for Housing and Urban Development Secretary Jack Kemp. During our heartfelt and insightful Reagan retrospective podcast with Ashley, she shares her unique experiences working closely with President Reagan. Ashley recounts the times when President Reagan's warm personality and deep respect for others made a significant impact on those around him. She also delves into a poignant story where President Reagan's true character and leadership shone through, using his wit and charisma during a challenging time she faced. Let's listen. My name is Ashley Parker Snyder. I was a White House intern and then became a White House trip coordinator in the advance office during President Reagan's second administration. So as a White House trip coordinator, we put together the minute-by-minute -minute schedule every time he left the White House, uh, went on an international trip, did a Rose Garden event, a Room 450 event, anything outside the White House grounds, we were responsible for putting together the schedule for it. Everyone always asks about the president and how he was with staff and how he was as a person. And in 1988, I was the lead on an in-town um, movement, as we called it. It was Mrs. Reagan's birthday, and they were going to the Kennedy Center to see Les Miserables. And at the intermission, we took Mrs. Reagan downstairs where the cast um, had a big cake for her, and they sang happy birthday, and it was really very cool. So we got him back to the presidential box, and all of a sudden I got word from the agent backstage to hold them in the box, because um, I don't know if you've seen Les Miserables or not, but there's a big barricade scene in the second act, and something had triggered the dogs 
And so they were gonna re-sweep the barricade because they couldn't be sure if it was you know, the fake or something more. Um, and so we held the president in the box and time was going by um, to the point where Jim Kuhn kind of looked at me and I said, the agents asked us to hold. And he said, okay. And the president and his guests were having champagne and having a nice time. And um, one of the guests became concerned about the fact that um, they hadn't been asked to take their seats again. And she was kind of grilling me about it. And the president, you know, who was probably 15 feet away from me, noticed what was going on. And he came over and he said, is everything okay? I said, Mr. President, the agents asked if you would just stay put for a moment while they double check something, but you'll be seated. And then right then I got the word, you can send them out in 30 seconds. So I said, oh, Mr. President, just got the word. You're gonna take your seats in about 30 seconds. And he said, oh, I was a lifeguard. I can hold my breath that long. And I thought the leader of the free world just walked across the room to make sure I was okay and to make me feel better about, you know, a potentially awkward situation. And I just thought that that kind of epitomizes what kind of a person he was. He was very generous in spirit and uh, just a kind, classy, old school kind of guy. I worked on the funeral here at the library um, when he passed. And I have two memories of that week. Um, when the president's uh, body was here lying in state, um, a lot of my colleagues had worked in DC um, or, and were preparing in DC for the state funeral and I was here at the library. And so I sort of, again, sort of had the everyday person that was coming. It, it wasn't dignitaries and heads of state, it was just people who, went out of their way to come and pay their final respects to him. And I will never forget the crowds of people who literally, I'm, you know, stood in line for hours. And I just think that that spoke volumes about his popularity and his place in history in this country. When the 747, when Air Force One flew past the library on their way to land, um, and they did the missing man kind of wing wobble, I call it, it was just a perfectly scripted Reagan moment. I mean, the sun was starting to fade a little bit and it was hitting the plane. And I was standing with Joe Brennan, who was a White House press lead, and he and I were here. And I just absolutely burst into tears. And it's just, it's one of my saddest, but weirdly fondest memories of saying goodbye to the president. I really miss the way the president conducted himself. I miss the respect that he demonstrated for the office. Um, I miss the respect that he gave the people who elected him. Um, I miss the civility. I miss the ability uh, for our politicians these days to work across the aisle, to be respectful of one another. And I miss his humility. More Reagan Retrospective podcasts after this message. The Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation is the nonprofit organization created by President Reagan himself and specifically charged by him with continuing his legacy and sharing his principles, individual liberty, economic opportunity, global democracy, and national pride. We must remain vigilant and work together to share these conservative principles with younger generations. Your role is critical to move our mission forward Thank you for your continued support. Please visit reaganfoundation.org slash give. That's reaganfoundation.org slash give. Now back to our Reagan Retrospective podcasts. From 1985 through 1989, Richard Burt served as President Reagan's ambassador to Germany. During that time, he was the chief negotiator of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, in this next Reagan retrospective video, you'll hear Ambassador Burt share his cherished memories of working with President Reagan. You'll discover his beliefs on what made Ronald Reagan's leadership unique, including his humility and collaborative spirit. Let's listen. In 1984, I was the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. And so when the President visited a European country or went to Europe, I would uh, be along to be his advisor on European issues. One of the most memorable experiences was I was in Berlin in 1987 when President Reagan stood in front of the Berlin Wall 
and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And there must have been about 15, 20,000 young Berliners who cheered, cheered wildly when he, when he made that statement. And uh, sure enough, it proved right. And Berlin Wall came down in 1989, largely because of the good work of President Reagan. Well, what struck me, because at the time, I was much younger than I am now, is it what re I recognized just how many sacrifices those people uh, in that era had made. Because we're talking about men who went through the rough years of the Depression, just as the Depression was ending, were, uh, went, into, went into battle in World War II. And it was, I think, fitting that somebody like Ronald Reagan and his generation was there to make my generation a generation behind Ronald Reagan to enjoy the fruits of what they had accomplished. So it meant an enormous amount to see Reagan talk to these people and bond with them in a very special way, in a kind of special human chemistry that only Ronald Reagan possessed. When I went into the Reagan administration, I was a young, ambitious guy in a hurry. And Ronald Reagan, of course, had a sign on his desk that talked about how much you could achieve if you didn't claim the credit. And that's what I learned from Reagan. He was a, basically a very humble man, a man who didn't always have to be the person who got the credit, who but got things done. And the reason in the end that so many people admired him and would support him, he didn't want just to be the star. He wanted to share the glory with everyone around him. And that was a very special talent. His principles were, I thought, valid, not only in the 1980s, but they're, they're valid now in the 2020s. I would like to see a way that politically, uh, people from both sides of the political spectrum could rediscover those values, those principles, whether it's America's global engagement, whether it's the uh, importance of having an economy based on people's ability to create and build big, impressive new ideas, uh, socially ways in which we could work together. Those were all sort of messages that flowed from the Reagan experience, and we need as a country to rediscover them. For our last Reagan retrospective video in today's podcast, we turn to our recent conversation with Ken Kachigian, President Reagan's chief speechwriter, who wrote the president's first inaugural address, his three main economic speeches, and the welcome home speech to the Iranian hostages. If you have ever been to the Reagan Library and toured through our Air Force One plane, tail number 27,000, you may even recall the IBM Selectric typewriter located in the staff cabin. That typewriter belonged to Ken Kachigian. In this video, you'll hear him talk about the typewriter, as well as sharing stories about Frank Sinatra and Roosevelt Greer during Reagan's 1984 campaign discovering the deep bond Ken and the president forged over Ronald Reagan's eight-year presidency. Let's listen. Hi, I'm Ken Kachigian, and I was the president's chief speechwriter. I was his chief speechwriter in the 1980 campaign. That's where I got to know President Reagan and created a real bond with him. And uh, we had a really great relationship. So that's why he wanted me to come in uh, to help start the administration do the first inaugural address and help with all the first speeches and began what he called the crusade. This is uh, an IBM correcting selectric typewriter. I don't know what uh, children, uh, young people know what a typewriter is. I worked on the president's first inaugural address with this typewriter and all the speeches I worked with him for the entire eight years of the presidency. From time to time, the president and I would work directly here. Uh, so he, that's the president's chair, right over there. And the first lady would sit here. But if the first lady wasn't traveling with us, uh, I would sit here and uh, work with him across the table with him, uh, editing a speech. My biggest memory is working on the 1988 convention speech. Another great day was uh, coming uh, back at the end of the campaign when we knew we were going to win. We had some special guests. Roosevelt Greer, the football player, came in, and Frank Sinatra was our guest that day. And Frank uh, Sinatra sort of snuck himself in 
not to try not to draw attention. You can only see the back of Frank Sinatra's head. He didn't want to take any glory away from um, uh, from the president that day. So that was one really special day. He was a presidential giant. He was a political legend. I was part of Ronald Reagan's uh, era of, of uh, bringing upon a, a new revolution, economic recovery to help end the Cold War, bring hope uh, to uh, a generation of people who were dispirited, but to be at, at a side to steady month by month and year by year and take that through the end to see that uh, he had a message to deliver to America that uh, he could uh, tell them about that record of what he had achieved to have been a part of that from, from the beginning in 1980 where we were uncertain of whether or not we were gonna achieve that in the campaign to have had a massive, uh, not only a great victory in 80, then a landslide in 1984, and to have changed the mood of America and to have been at his side and to have created a bond with him. It's hard to even define what that experience is. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger we made the city freer, and we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. And so, goodbye, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. These Reagan Retrospective podcasts are only a small handful of the podcasts we publish every year. We recommend you visit youtube.com slash Reagan Foundation to subscribe to this playlist. Simply go to our YouTube channel, click on Playlists, and find the one entitled Reagan Retrospective. Thank you for listening. For more information on the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, including information on how to become a member, information on upcoming exhibits at the Reagan Library, and more information on the legacy of President Reagan, please visit reaganfoundation.org. And don't forget to like and follow the Reagan Foundation on all social media platforms. Until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you. Don't forget to subscribe to A Reagan Forum podcast in your iTunes or Google Play stores and on other podcast platforms as they become available. New episodes of A Reagan Forum come out every Thursday. Like what you hear? Check out our Words to Live By podcast featuring radio addresses and speeches Ronald Reagan delivered from the 1960s through the 1980s. New episodes drop every Tuesday. And don't forget to follow at Ronald Reagan on Facebook, at Ronald Reagan on Twitter, and Reagan Foundation on YouTube. Also, search for us on SoundCloud and Stitcher.